just waiting for this to show me its stream. Okay, I think we're on. Well, good morning. Um, so welcome to this week's live stream, going into um, the, the cult of productivity, um, the, the origins of um, a lot of the fervor of the need to be useful, having having something to contribute. I'll give a bunch of examples in a moment. But um, first, I'd like to ask if you're here, just say hi. I want to see that you're here. Um, it, it helps me to feel when people are watching so I can have a sense of uh, how to engage. A little bit of context for those who might be showing up for the first time or seeing this episode first. Um, this is an episodic series I'm doing on sharing some pieces and snapshots of what I call mimetic literacy. I sometimes um, playfully to myself refer to this as living history. The idea is uh, not just to go through historical things as a matter of, oh, here, this happened, and then this happened, and this happened, but to, um, to give some context for things that are very alive for us today that live in our bodies and live in our minds and guide how we think and how we live, the choices we make, the way that we organize as a society. And that everything that we're doing is in some sense a replay of the past, but we're replaying a lot of past. So seeing that and noticing the way that it lives inside of each of us and seeing the ways that we're, we're, we're trying to solve the same problems that we've been solving for a long time and that we're enacting the same solutions that we have been helps to give a lot of context for what we're all doing. Okay. Um, <clears> that sounds very abstract, but it's, it's actually very, very grounded. It's very practical. So Mia, let me jump into a little bit of uh, today's. We'll just go straight into it. So <laughs> giving an example by enacting it. So um, just uh, so yesterday, I was having a conversation with a group of people exploring this question of what is the nature of free will? And this is, um, in some ways, it feels like a silly conversation to me. It's like it's got some interesting elements to it. But there's, there's something that's, um, that's uh, missing from these kinds of conversations. It's something that's very, very common to miss in these sort of conversations. So there's this, this um, thing of um, like, where, where is there room in a scientific worldview for us to have anything like free will? Uh, it seems like science says there isn't. Like obviously we have brains and our brains produce effects and like there's just this robot so obviously anything that is free will has to be an illusion, right? Uh, this seems to violate something for a lot of people's intuition. Obviously I can choose to move my fingers and I'm not sure what it even means for that to be an illusion. Uh, and there's also an element of, does it matter? Like it doesn't affect, like, like this question of whether there's free will or not, doesn't affect things like, I don't know, I'm like, I, I need a job. Like I have a friend who's looking for a job who like really needs money, uh, but he doesn't want to compromise his own uh, his own artistic integrity. So he's going, I, I, I don't know how to combine these two things. I'm, I'm really looking around for this. I think asking questions about free will doesn't help. doesn't help anything. Um, but, um, you know, actually, I think, I think maybe a, a more potent angle is to, is to point at uh, some, uh, some experiences from my time in the Bay Area and in uh, in looking at uh, something that's called effective altruism. So, in the, the, so the company I used to run there, at the Center for Applied Rationality, we would get a lot of people who would come in wanting to do the most good that they can in the world. The, the logic of um, effective altruism is, uh, like it, it sounds quite um, sort of clever, kind. So it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating mix of things there. Uh, the basic idea is that if if you have two different charities that are, let's say, trying to um, feed the homeless, and for one charity, um, I, 
if and one charity ends up converting a given dollar, like if, if you donate uh, $100 to one charity, uh, maybe uh, $50 of that goes into them running the organization and the other 50 goes into buying food. And for the other one, uh, maybe only $20 goes to administration paying their staff, uh, um, <laughs> fundraising, etc. And $80 goes to feeding the homeless. So in some sense, the second organization is more efficient if you care about um, your dollars going to immediately helping people rather than some kind of weird administrative thing, like it's not overhead. So if the thing that you actually care about is feeding the homeless, you would want to send your dollars to the second organization. So effective altruism asks questions like, which charities are most effective? Um, what does effective mean? How do we really help the most? For instance, it, does it even make sense to focus on uh, feeding the homeless in comparison to, say, trying to push reform in order to make it so that there aren't homeless people? And so there's, there's a lot of intelligence that goes into the basic idea of effective altruism. You get some really counterintuitive things like for a long time, uh, if you wanted to maximize the number of lives saved per dollar, uh, it looked like the best analysis was that you should donate to a particular uh, charity, the Against Malaria Foundation, that was about uh, getting uh, malaria nets, just basically bug nets that I think were soaked in some kind of anti-bug stuff, if I remember right, uh, and that those would get shipped to people who lived in areas where there were mosquitoes that would give malaria. This was just overwhelmingly, in terms of lives saved per dollar, one of the absolute best charities to donate to. I don't know if that's still true by the numbers, but it was like five years ago, if I remember right. So uh, the basic idea makes a lot of sense to me. But there is this really consistent problem that would show up. People would come into... CIFAR workshops, Center for Applied Rationality workshops, the workshops that I would help to run, uh, as effective altruists, identifying as effective altruists. Um, <clears throat> not saying that they are effective, but that they wanted to be. This is not, an, not just an, uh, a, an ego boosting thing. This was a, I really want to do this. I want to make a positive impact. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> And they would come in with a lot of angst. So they would, they would have a sense of, am I doing enough good? Am I, like, what, what career do I go into? Um, where, like, like my, like one, one, of, one of the strategies for effective altruism uh, was to uh, become an investment banker, not because they thought, doing investment banking was actually a good thing for the world, but because that was the easiest pathway to making a lot of money. And with a lot of money, you could donate more. So this is a strategy called earning to give, where if you didn't have uh, a, if you, you didn't have a lot to contribute in terms of direct works, that maybe one of the most effective things you could do is to raise money to give to others who were in a better position to do good work. But how do you raise money? And then that question gets isolated. And the question is, how do you make money most effectively? And one of the best strategies that got converged on in the EA community is investment banking. Um, and the idea being that any kind of uh, social or economic or ecological damage that's done by being an investment banker uh, is uh, more than outdone by the intent to donate some significant chunk of one's money. To, uh, to effective charities, not just charities to assuage guilt, but like the intent, the entire reason for being in that field is to summon money to do good in the world. Um, interestingly enough, the, um, they often uh, uh, have a, a, an earning to give pledge that pledges 10% of one's income. And it's a little tongue in cheek reference to tithing. I think it's probably where they got the idea from. And tithing is an old um, uh, Catholic practice. Right? So we're already seeing some elements of this, this religiosity in the background. 
it's a little more conscious in this case, like why 10%, we could call it tithing, tithing being giving your 10% of your income to the church. It's like, it's all there. They, they think that's very conscious. But I'm, I'm wanting to, so the, the, one of the problems that this, um, this whole structure would run into is that people would, like there, there was no place to rest. People would burn out. People would come into CFAR workshops um, full of anxiety, full of fear of burning out, having burned out, uh, just not knowing what to do. Because even though the strategy makes sense, they couldn't keep doing it. There was no room to keep doing it. So this, this kind of, um, like over and over again, it, it seemed like the, the kind of advice that I kept needing to give people, the various people at Sufar needed to keep giving these people, uh, were variations on, well, how about you care for yourself? And the inclination could almost get this, like there's this fearful tone that would come in and, and, and so of something like, oh, well, like, is it okay for me to focus on myself? Because like, I'm, I'm doing really well, but what about all of those like children dying in Africa? What about um, all of the like the potential future getting wiped out by some sort of existential risk, something uh, like artificial intelligence destroying everything or uh, nuclear war or something like that. And I could, and if I could have helped, but I didn't, what does that mean about me? This is the piece that I'm wanting to highlight. It's very, very loud in effective altruism. Very, very loud. Um, so like the, often, it is possible to get people to a place of recognizing, you know, it's it's important to care for yourself, because if you don't care for yourself, you don't have the resources with which to help others. The whole um, the the plain metaphor that's been overused to put on your own oxygen mask before helping others, um, because the the move that that often gets taken there is something like, oh, it's only okay for me to care for myself because that is a necessity for me to be able to fulfill my moral duty of helping others. There's a lot of obligation tone to this. A lot of, uh, there is something wrong with me if I don't use my privilege or my resources in order to help others. I am a bad person if I don't. So um, this, this sense of guilt, like I, I, uh, the inability to enjoy what one has because uh, what one has is compared to others who have not. And if, uh, if you just sit there and enjoy it, that makes you nasty or bad or corrupt or uncaring. It's, it means there's something wrong with you. So this is uh, one particularly loud example, but I wanna give a, a few others in order to highlight the mimetic thread I'm talking about. Um, this was a, uh, the, the effect of altruist Mimetic mutation was a very loud one that appeared in the last 20 years. Um, and a lot of people have a visceral sense of there's something wrong with this and I don't want to touch it. Even though the logic makes sense, it's something of like this, uh, not for me. I'm, I'm going to go play basketball with my friends. <laughs> right, there's, there's, there's something off. So what I want to talk about is that something off. So let me highlight a couple of other cases that show up. Um, my uh, uh, a dear friend, um, uh, <laughs> I'm not quite sure how to, how to highlight the right relationship. Uh, there's somebody I dated uh, whom I'm still very good friends with uh, back when we were dating. She was very uh, tied up in knots about the inability to rest. This is a common theme you'll see in this particular mimetic threat, the inability to rest. Uh, she was just overwhelmed with a sense of needing to improve herself. Like Self-development. She's very, very big into, um, and she got into uh, Landmark. Um, I just helped her go through some of the things that she had stored here to see, you know, do you want these things sent to you or would you rather me get rid of them? So she's going through a minimalist purge and have some things stored in my place. And uh, she had this big folder that uh, was called the Doer's Circle. <laughs> like this this whole program based on on taking action like something like some people are um, 
uh, sit passively by to watch the world do things. And some people are involved in doing. You're part of the doer's inner circle. So this means that you get up and you do the things and it's like, like take the action. You know, I'm, I'm starting to lean a little bit here in, like there's a, there's a piece that if you listen to it, you can get a bit of the evangelical quality of Tony Robbins. This is about your personal power. Awaken the giant within. You can do it. Right? This, this whole like, yeah. So the, 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 the ramping up of all this energy and, and like, like go forth and do it. Why? Well, um, because if you're not doing, if you're not accomplishing, then, um, then what? And she had a lot of the sense that uh, there was something wrong with her. That if she wasn't um, developing, if she wasn't offering something, if she wasn't getting a lot of acclaim, if she wasn't um, offering something to the world that was meaningful, then um, that meant that that meant something about her. It meant that she was inadequate. It meant that uh, she had work that she needed to do. And if she wasn't attending to that work, she wasn't attending to her work. Right? So something as simple as uh, being tired and needing to lay down and just rest wasn't an option for her for years. She was very conscious of this. And I remember at one point she had sort of broken down crying about how she was so tired that she couldn't rest because if she tried to rest, she, her whole her mind and her emotions would attack her for being lazy, for needing the rest. And it could only, she could only get so far about resting in order to be capable of having the resources to be able to accomplish, to offer things, to do her work. Right? As though there's something wrong with her that she needs those things. Like if she were a truly good person, she wouldn't need to rest because the goodness would be its own reward. It would be its own rejuvenation. Are you seeing this thread, this common thread? I'll give one more example, an example of my own life. I, um, back when I was working at CIFAR, I, I had a very clear sense of, there's a, a different way to do um, uh, psychology and to do culture. Oh. That, I see it's very, very important. I still do. I still see this as something like uh, 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 humanity, obviously, uh, like either humanity will make a certain kind of shift or um, we'll tear down our civilization and possibly kill a lot of people in the process. Right? Those are sort of the two paths that I see as plausible. And um, I had and still have a very clear sense of, oh, this is a different way of being. This specific one falls in this category. Here are some steps in this direction. These are some specific inner moves that one can make in order to be more aligned with a possible future where these things are powerful and effective, where, where it's actually possible to, uh, to create um, a superculture, a civilization that can do things differently, more sanely and more kindly. So I could see this vision and um, there is this quality of um, I, I needed people to listen to me as I describe this, as I try to offer it. And um, I also could see how, so th this example could get very long. Let me see if I can, if I can shorten it. There's a lot of nuance here. I could tell that I needed my income to be based on giving people a way to make this kind of shift. That, that was a, a contribution I could clearly make. And it felt sort of like this is the contribution I'm supposed to make. Not entirely clear where this supposed to is coming from. I often wondered this, um, but uh, there it was. And so how to deal with that, how to orient to it. 
Um, so I would try to um, I would try to build businesses based on I mean because like CFAR CFAR um, got got stuck in a particular way that I couldn't interface with to to make this happen. So uh, split ways and tried to create my own business. Um, I've done a couple of iterations of this. Uh, I now have something that's kind of going along. It's doing okay. It's it's not as as, as active as I would like, but uh, even today, every now and then, I will get this sort of uh, jab of something like, um, I could be doing more. Why aren't I doing more? I could be giving more lectures. I could be um, creating a stronger environment. This shows up as like, my income is not as abundant as I could really use. And that, uh, that lack of abundance is, is reflecting something about how much I'm showing up. Am I showing up enough? enough for what? Like that, that question isn't quite asked. Um, so this quality of, uh, like I, I know a bunch of these things about, oh, rest is important. And so I'm trying to rest. And then um, it's not as alive for me anymore, but it used to be very similar to my ex, very similar to um, what I would see with effective altruists. This quality of um, trying to rest feels like a demonstration of some kind of failure of my being that uh, maybe if I just worked harder, maybe if I just worked more, like obviously there are things that need to be done. So if I sat down and I figured out what needs to be done, I just sit and I think about it. And once I come up with a plan, I do the plan. Um, like if I, if I just have caffeine enough, maybe I can just take care of it. I can get to a certain level of stability. Then I'll be okay because I will have accomplished some baseline where I'm actually doing the work I'm supposed to do, whatever that is. A lot of the vagueness here, there's a lot of vagueness. Like in the, in this vagueness thread is an important part of the thing I'm pointing out. Vagueness shows up here in terms of do what? Get more money. It's not about just getting more money. I'm trying to use the money as a reflection of am I showing up in the world in the right way? So, uh, okay, so what am I supposed to do? Is there's a supposed to, where's the supposed to coming from? Uh, uh, same kind of thing with my friend who had this sense of she's supposed to work on herself. She needs to improve in order to deal with whatever is wrong with her. Same thing with the effective altruists. They're supposed to do the most good they can. At least that has some kind of concreteness. But what is the most good they can do? Come up with a plan. Even if they have an explicit plan, there's something of a shutdown. Like, oh, I can't like people who try to do earning to give often run into problems of getting depressed or burnt out. Right? That's an interesting problem. Right? And so there's this like this vagueness of, well, if it's literally impossible for me, for instance, to earn to give. And that's the best strategy I can think of for doing the most good, then what is the actual most good I can do? And finding every pathway you turn towards being a form of exhaustion or burnout can create this feedback loop of, I guess I am just a terrible person. Okay, so these are things that I've personally seen. And there are lots and lots and lots and lots of examples. I think um, people who feel like not having a job is a moral failing, like that it's embarrassing to, um, uh, to admit that one is uh, unemployed. I mean, that's curious, why would that be? Oh, because you're mooching on society, you're not contributing. That's, that's an odd assumption. Where does that narrative come from? Also, does anybody actually think that or are people just worried about others thinking that? <laughs> like, so this, this just appears all over the, over the place, everywhere. Like are, are homeless people inferior? Are they morally inferior? Where do these ideas come from? So it turns out that this, this whole thread is, uh, like it, it has, I mean, to some, to some extent, you, you can ask a question sort of like, oh, where does that person's high cheekbones come from? And you can follow the genetic thread of their family going, oh, it turns out that, um, that uh, 
um, despite this person looking Caucasian, they're, um, or Caucasian's confusing because Cauc the Caucasus Mountains are in a part of Asia, but, uh, but you could say something like, despite this person looking European, like them looking basically European, they're really high cheekbones uh, coming from having a, a great, great grandmother who was Mongolian. Right? And so that, so in some sense, you've found the genetic thread, but then there's the question of, well, where, where did the Mongols get their high cheekbones from? Right? <laughs> you, can, you can keep tracing this back. So when I'm talking about tracing mimetic threads, um, I, it's worth tracking that what I'm talking about is are sort of pivotal moments, pivotal introductions, or um, pivotal mutations, but that you can trace these threads back in, as far back in time as you like. So in some important sense, the thread that produces uh, this particular aspect of guilt and work and the need for productivity is in the ballpark of 500 years old. This came into our mimetic environment about 500 years ago. There were things from there before that definitely contributed related to the agricultural revolution, which is many thousands of years old. The, uh, the need to, um, like at the agricultural revolution, there is a, a transformation in one's relationship to work. Like it, it's, it's worth noticing that the word work both is this quality of effort, right? Effort to earn. Like, I, 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 like what do you do for work? Like that kind of work, that uh, occupation. It's interesting, occupation um, uh, mean, means to, to fill a slot, like to, to occupy a room. What is your occupation? Where do you fit in? It's literally what an occupation is. How do you fit in? Um, so the word work has this, um, like there's an effortful quality to it. Like it, it is work to, like I'm listening to somebody mowing their lawn outside. And so that, that is a, it's a kind of work to push the lawnmower. It is work to, um, to go and be part of the bureaucracy. Like you go work for the Department of Motor Vehicles or something like that. Uh, but work also means function. Is the car working? Oh, this, uh, like my lawnmower stopped working. Right? And, and that, that quality of like the double meaning of the word work hides in it something very important. And that the, um, this, this element of what, what is it that you do? Having this, uh, what part of the machine are you? How do you fit in as a gear into this mechanism? What is the thing you do when you are working, when you are functioning as a member of society what role do you play? Oh, you don't play any role? That means you're not relevant to my role, to my work. And this is particularly thick. This particular attitude got super thick in, uh, um, in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. A lot of startup culture. There's this uh, thing of, so what's your thing? What do you do? And it's, it's an evaluative thing. Like it's like, oh, let me get to know you, but it's secretly, let me get to know whether I can use you and like whether we can help each other with the thing that you're, um, that you're trying to do here. Let's see, Marcel mentioning, interesting, German uses two different words there. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, um, yeah, it's a lot of this uh, went specifically through the particular mimetic thread that I'm tracking went through uh, England and particularly Scotland. So a lot of the um, a lot of the nuances that I'm picking out here will show up predominantly in English. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, I, I faintly remember something like that about that in German as well. I believe you. So so this this hint is highlighting something of this, this very functional characteristic. And this is, um, this started with the agricultural revolution, but really took off with the industrial revolution. Um, the whole thing about factory workers. But a lot of the industrial revolution got its way of going because of the Protestant Reformation. And so it could be a little counterintuitive. Like, what does this have to do with the Protestant Reformation? Why, like, what, what is Christianity and the, and the shift of Christianity have to do with any of this? Well, it's, it's worth bearing in mind that, um, like if, 
if you if you want an orientation to the arc of Western history, uh, in my opinion, the two most pivotal events in the last thousand years, in terms of how we are, in terms of what our mimetic environment is, and sort of, well, two of the most pivotal, I should say, um, in terms of why our mimetic environment is the way it is, is the Black Death in the 1300s and the foundation of mathematical science courtesy of Isaac Newton in the 1600s. Those are like the two really big pivot points, really, really major ones. Um, so the, there's a, the, the reason for the Black Death being so important is that that ripped out a lot of the foundation of European culture. Like the, in, there was no more stability. Like something new had to come in. So because you just wiped out not only um, not only literal lives, so there were fewer people to be able to sustain the structures that they were previously doing, uh, but there was also a a sense of uh, the clergy, the the monks and priests and so on, were just as susceptible to the Black Death as the common folk. There's this question of what are we doing wrong? Why did God send this to us? Uh, why don't the clergy have an answer to this? Why are they just as susceptible? And that created room for the mercantile class, particularly focused in Venice, um, but, uh, but a lot of the money moved into Florence. So Italy, Italy being this like, big central place where a lot of stuff had room to explode uh, because of the capacity for ships to do trade. Like it's surprising how 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 many little details can weave in to make this the center, but um, but uh, this allowed um, economic growth and change to happen much more rapidly. Like the change that happened uh, in the fourteen and fifteen hundreds is dramatically more than the changes from uh, like one thousand to thirteen hundred. Just like even though that's a three hundred year period compared to a two hundred year period, the Renaissance is just so much more explosive so much more. So um, this introduced a huge amount of change. And uh, one of the results of this huge amount of change included that um, uh, Martin Luther ended up pushing back against, hey, the church is doing some things that are kind of screwy. And he nailed his 95 theses, I believe it was in 1516, somewhere in that ballpark, the 15 teens. I don't remember the exact year, but early 1500s, okay, in the, in the ballpark of 150 years after the Black Death. Okay. So the, uh, the, the, the reason this is relevant is because it was, a, uh, it was an expression of, of um, the collapse of a meaning-making structure, uh, very core to for humanity to orient to a sense of, I know what I am doing with my life. And I, I know how I am acting, how I'm interacting with my environment. I know what I'm doing. I know how I fit into the larger picture and I know how to engage with my current activity and why my current activity matters to things I care about. In order for that to be possible, uh, a given person needs a meaning making framework to plug into. For babies, this is incredibly simple. I am figuring out what this is. Right? <laughs> they, they, their their, their meaning-making framework doesn't have a lot of intellectual stuff. But they have something like that, a kind of um, a feedback with the environment, a way of interacting with the environment that feels meaningful to them on the inside. Like, wow, this is fascinating. What is this? Right? There's this, this quality of, let me explore this. The exploration feels meaningful. And that as I do so, I'm learning things. Of course, they don't think this way, but this is true. This is part of the lived experience of being an infant, of um, like this, this like, like learning in and of itself has this inherent importance to it. In particular, learning how to engage with other people, seeing faces and, and uh, finding out how do I interact with this face? What is the interaction? How do I feel this? <gasps> Whoa, what's this? I can move it. Like there's, there's this engagement. And part of the importance of it all is that it feels meaningful. It 
feels relevant. So it's very, very simple for infants. But as we build more and more complex minds and more and more complex experiences of our world, by the time we get to be adults, a meaning-making framework sounds like a philosophy or a paradigm. I don't have a lot of struggle trying to figure out what a cup is. This is not the center of my meaning making. And I can stare at the cup and a lot of, um, a lot of very deep spiritual practices involve zooming in on some of the earlier developmental levels that you may have sort of hopped over for various reasons. I may go into this at some point, but like, rather than going so much into history, I may highlight something about um, uh, how the law of evolution actually applies to means and to mimetic structures, the structure of thought and the structure of culture. When you learn how to see this, you can, you can start to see how what we do and how we think actually follows the same laws that provide the shape of trees and uh, predator prey dynamics. They're all the same thing. It's the same sort of principle set. Um, you, you can be very powerful to learn how to see this. In the background, this is a lot of what I use in order to note, oh, these are the important elements. Sort of like when you're, when you're looking at a predator prey environment and you notice, oh, there's not enough grass. That's the important part. It doesn't matter that it's sunny or not because the problem is that the grass isn't growing. Uh, and uh, why is that important? Because the grass is what the prey eat and the prey eat in order to reproduce and the reproduction is related to um, the, uh, the dynamic of the predator prey so that so the, the fact that there isn't enough grass is what's going to define the whole predator-prey dynamic. It doesn't matter what color the trees are. <laughs> so the ability to pick out what's relevant and what's not, and having this kind of lens, being able to see in a larger picture. Um, so um, I mentioned that because the need for wisdom traditions to go into previous developmental stages and sort of finish the development, the level of have you actually looked at a cup? Can you look at the cup without adding framework and relate to it and notice what you are skipping over and why when you're seeing your thoughts instead of seeing the cup? And so this is very Zen flavored in how I'm highlighting this. But um, this is important because a lot of the memes that we've developed that define our culture, including the one that's the main theme of today, encourage us to skip over developmental stages and act as if we are more advanced than we are. So, um, uh, but if you, if you sort of ignore that for the moment, for the most part, acting as an adult involves operating in a much larger framework where you are experiencing the world and an interpretation of the world. You're interacting with this whole thing and you have some way of making sense of it. One of the most classical ways in the Western and Westernized at this point world to do that orientation was Christianity. So Christendom defining Western Europe and being like a, a lot of the a lot of the um, colonialist uh, efforts, particularly during the uh, um, the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, especially the Renaissance. Um, had a tone of uh, well, let's let's also um, forward the mission. Right, let's let's spread Christendom, in part because different factions of Christendom after the Reformation were competing with each other. So, um, what does Christianity offer in terms of a meaning-making framework? Well, like, uh, before I've described this as there being three components, and it turns out like the John Brubaker gives this uh, breakdown as well. He describes it a little differently, but it's basically. Um, how does the world make sense? How do, uh, what, what, what is the arc of time that you are in? Like how does what, uh, how does the way that the world makes sense relate to the flow of ancient times and the way that time goes into the future? Like what is our past and what is our future? And how can you personally participate in the arc of time given this context? So three core pieces of a meaning-making framework. This is not like from on high, these are the magic things. It just is just a frame, a meta frame for understanding frameworks to see, oh, how does the meaning-making structure work here? So with Christianity, there is this, at least the long used to be, this thing of um, we are in the lesser world. 
Um, this, is, this is just a, a small aspect of the total kingdom of God. And the true kingdom of God is vast, immense. And part of coming into being a full person in relationship to the divine involves this process of the uh, receiving the salvation of Christ and listening to the teachings of Christ uh, and uh, Christ's church. In Catholicism in particular, there was not so much emphasis on Jesus, although Jesus is very much a major figure. It's uh, Jesus's authority that, um, that grants the church's legitimacy. So Jesus said, like, upon this rock, upon Peter, which literally means like petrified, Peter means rock. Um, upon this rock, I will build my church. So Peter is the first pope. And then in that succession, it is um, the, the, um, uh, the blessing of Christ through the lineage of the popes that provides the legitimacy of the, what we would now call the Catholic church. That's, that's part of the theory. That's part of the history. And arcing into the future, I actually don't know what old, um, uh, old Catholic Christianity said about this, so I'm, 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 I'll skip over that part. I'm not entirely clear about the details of that. But there is this thing about um, in, in the course of dying, dying is this transition into the arms of God, the arms of the Lord. Um, <clears throat> oh, that's neat. Uh, I've been mentioning uh, in French, uh, Peter is literally the same word as stone. Pierre and Pierre. Yeah, I actually didn't know that. That's cool. So, um, <clears throat> in, uh, this, in, in, in old Catholicism, and I think this is still true, there are these sacraments that you go through in order to uh, participate in this process of going into the future and being part of whatever God's plan is. But it is not yours to know God's plan. The way that you participate, which gets to this third point, is that you accept the teachings of the church and the, the blessing of grace. So you attend mass and you go to confessional and you receive the teachings of the priesthood of Christ. And so there's this whole meaning-making structure that makes sense. You can orient to it. The, way, the reason the world is the way it is is because of the, um, they, I don't think they said the will of God at the time. The concept of the will of God being so central was, was a fair bit later. But you think prior to the Black Death, and certainly prior to uh, Augustine in the 1200s, there is a, um, there's this quality of this, the way in which we are in almost like a fake world. A shadow world from speaking of neoplatonism like this is this is not the true world the true world is the world of god and that um, the whole process of engaging in in uh, salvation is a matter of moving to the true world uh, if, uh, if you ever uh, need some orientation to well, what wait what's neoplatonism uh think of the matrix the reason neo is called neo is because it is short for neoplatonism which emphasizes the one, which is why Neo is the one. Um, the whole thing about being in a fake world that with, a, um, uh, with an intelligence that is trying to trick you and that the whole point is to appeal to the uh, true divinity beyond through a kind of reception of knowing. Um, that is, uh, is like a mix of, um, of uh, Neoplatonism and Gnosticism. Um, <clears throat> but uh, anyway, so that's, but that's, if you just look at the at least the first film, first film of the Matrix. Uh, that's Neoplatonism. So, with the Reformation, uh, there there had already been a sense of because of the Black Death, there had already been already been a sense of wait, this way of orienting to reality and to what I'm doing, what how I make that my act of doing farming feel meaningful and relevant to a larger picture rather than just I'm farming because if I don't, I will not eat. Okay, well, once you get past the basic physical survival, uh, and particularly when you're looking at the possibility of the, the, the fact of mortality, eventually I will not survive. How do I orient to that fact? You have this meaning-making framework that's cracking. And the Reformation basically named, hey, I don't think the church has it anymore. It was Martin Luther saying, I don't think the church has the, uh, um, the legitimacy of 
heaven anymore. I think that it needs some kind of reform. And um, uh, Luther was apparently shocked to discover that uh, not only a bunch of people super resonated with his point, but that they decided to go and split off and form a bazillion other churches. <laughs> he was apparently pretty upset about this. Um, it's worth remembering that Martin Luther was a Catholic priest. And I'm not entirely clear on whether it was his intent to create a competitor church or if he wanted the Catholic church to change what it was doing. I'm a little fuzzy on historical details there. But. Okay, so all of this leads up to, so that's early 1500s. And then you shift to the mid to late 1500s. Um, there's the Christendom is fractured. Um, a lot of the reason the Reformation could really take off is because of the invention of the Gutenberg press. So the, um, the Bible stopped being something that uh, monks were copying by hand and instead could be something that could be printed in the local language. I believe the first language was German. So the, um, you could print a translation of the Bible into German and make it widely available. So this, this was hugely pivotal for everybody to be able to refer to the Bible directly instead of needing to talk to a priest. Um, so uh, this is a lot of where the Protestant idea of uh, your connection to God is, is personal, it's direct. It, you don't need an intermediary of some sort of priest or something because the word of God is in the Bible already. So you can just work with the word of God and come to understand God's teachings and Christ's, uh, the, the salvation through Christ by a personal relationship with these teachings. And the purpose of any kind of church or something is something like to act as a reminder. And so here you, you, there's, there's, there's a lot of pivot of, well, maybe there's a different way to construct a meaning making system. The, uh, the beautiful piece of work that uh, John Calvin did. Now, this is uh, mid to late 1500s. He brought in a tone that was, it was already fairly present. There were elements of this that you'll find in, um, in, the, uh, in the, the, the writings of Paul in the Bible. And you'll also see this in the, uh, the writings of Augustine who basically created Christianity. He fused together um, old Roman Christianity with um, uh, Neoplatonism, Gnosticism, and a little bit of Aristotelian worldview stuff. And he created a meaning-making engine that defined the West for a thousand years. Uh, and it still does. Augustine's thing is intensely pivotal. It's the basic template of Christian meaning-making. This would have been, uh, pretend it was 500 AD. <laughs> like that's. Like he, he had one foot in the Roman Empire and one foot in the Middle Ages. So, um, but what, what Calvin did is he, he, he synthesized all of this in terms of really emphasizing the way in which people are wicked. If there's this, uh, this teaching that uh, is uh, particularly um, like part, part of the real signature of John Calvin is uh, something called uh, total depravity, the teaching of total depravity, the idea that original sin sort of uh, corrupts everything about who you are by the very act of your existence, that anything you do is going to be inherently wicked and evil and awful, that you can't actually do good works except by the grace of God who can wash away your sin. But it isn't like you get God's grace and the sin washes away and now you're fine. No, 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 no. Because you are such a wretched creature that it is by God's continual grace and mercy that you are given the opportunity to do good works. The way that you... Um, allow that, like you have free will, but your free will amounts to something like the ability to reject God's grace. Now it's worth 
bearing in mind, I didn't cover this so much in this session, but there's, but in previous episodes, I've emphasized this a fair bit. The, um, the basic, the, there's something that I keep referring to as the scar on the Western soul. This is, um, this started with Thomas Aquinas saying that it's not that this world is fake and there is a true world beyond, but rather that there is a spiritual world and a physical world and they're both real. This was in order to uh, reconcile the fact that Aristotelian logic and reason uh, doesn't um, agree with a bunch of the teachings of the church. So how do you reconcile that? And Aquinas's suggestion was to say reason is of the realm of the physical world and that um, faith is of the realm of the spiritual world and the spiritual world is higher, it's more important. This uh, paved the way for Descartes to be able to say, well, can we uh, just say that the church is correct about the things that matter in the spiritual world and that in the, um, and that uh, science, this, the, like the time I think it was just still called natural philosophy, but the, the, the exploration of the physical world is merely about the physical world. So anything I discover by, for instance, cutting open cadavers and exploring things about how anatomy works can't possibly have anything to say about the higher world because that's the dominion of the church. And this is merely the physical world. Okay, so can we just have that split? Okay, so it was basically a deal that, um, uh, that Descartes made so that he could dissect cadavers. Okay? And um, this kept going until the scientific revolution said, actually, there's no evidence of there being a spiritual world. So let's just get rid of it. So it's like this saw that's been happening um, where we start from the relevant world is the higher one to maybe there is no higher world. So this is it, resulting in us being in the realm of the shadows to refer to Plato's allegory of the cave. This is a way to express what some people call the meaning crisis. This, this scar in the Western soul being this cut between the higher world and this world, such that we, we don't have contact with the higher world anymore. Um, an example of where you see this is how um, uh, physics uh, has all of these laws, all these descriptions, like oh, general relativity shows the structure of how the universe works. But where is general relativity? Where are Maxwell's equations? They're not in the physical world. So how are they shaping the physical world? Is there some true mathematical world that is beyond the physical world where these laws reside? In which case, what is the relationship between them? How is it that these laws are coming in and influencing the physical world? It can't be by a physical mechanism. It has to be something else. But those questions aren't interesting. It's the fact that those questions aren't interesting or they sound confused. This is an expression of our modern conundrum. And uh, this is one of the core reasons why for instance, um, we have the philosophical hard problem of consciousness. How is it possible for physical processes to produce subjective experience? That is arising from this idea that we live in this physical world that has no larger context. And yet here we are experiencing it. So another way to describe this sever is the sever between subject and object, the idea that subject and object can be distinct, that I am looking at the cup. So there is a me and a cup and the two are distinct and it's possible for me to observe the cup without being affected. It's another expression of the same cup. Okay, so um, I mention all of this because uh, the, there, in doing this cut, there's no higher world but there is a lower world. It is possible to, I think the, problem, the, the, uh, the standard way this gets expressed in Christianity is heaven and hell. Now, heaven having this kind of weird fictional quality to it, hell also has the same weird fictional quality to it, but the origin of these stories of heaven and hell are way older than Christianity. Way, way, way older. And the, the way that uh, the lower world gets expressed in our modern myths in like the scientific mythology, which is it's absolutely a mythology, although they don't want to call it that because they've cut themselves off from acknowledgement of the higher world. 
but the way that this shows up in science is something like the fear of getting it wrong. The fear of being so corrupt in your belief system that you are impossibly wrong. So the, uh, the militant atheist push of saying, no, we have to get rid of religion because religion is corrupting our worldview. Well, what happens if the worldview is corrupted? I mean, if these, these are just physical processes, what's so bad about believing false things? What's, what's the issue? Oh, we can't, we can't uh, manipulate the world as well, you think. I'm not sure why you think that, but even if it's true, what's the problem? What exactly is the problem if we all die? Why does it matter? It's mattering is, is in reference to there is something larger for me to, to move towards and become in relationship to. So the, um, the reason this is relevant is that even though uh, the mythology of being part of something larger starts to fall away, the possibility of condemnation and damnation is still very present. You will see this in the quality of how Calvinism spread, how it, how it moved. This idea of total depravity. Um, uh, what was that song? I once was lost, but now am found. There's a line in there of uh, something like, um, uh, I wish I could remember the whole verse, but there's a, there's a piece that uh, is like, how could God love a wretch like me? A wretch, I am wretched, right? It's so fascinating. How, what, what's with this business of being wretched? I am awful, I am corrupt, this, I am terrible. Now this, this element existed before. Um, Self-flagellation is totally a thing that um, that uh, monks did prior to the Reformation, wearing hair shirts, going through, um, uh, like, uh, what was his name? Uh, I think it was Savonarola. I may be confusing uh, monks, but there, there was one person who basically tried to kill the, uh, um, the, uh, the Renaissance uh, in Florence and uh, was eventually burned at the stake because he was trying to get people to turn back to <clears throat> Yeah, thank you. Uh, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Thank you. Um, so, um, you know, so th this, this thread of there is something wrong with me, there's something wrong with pleasure. Pleasure is a distraction. Um, I can't enjoy things because that's the path of the devil. Th those things were already present in Christianity, but Calvin made this central, made it absolutely central that uh, you are inherently corrupt by original sin and that it is only by hard work and faith that you can, um, uh, that uh, you can uh, sort of, you, you can purge yourself of sin, but you can't actually purge yourself because it's purely by God's grace and God's grace is not something you can control and that's a good thing because if you could you would use it for evil so if like this is part of God's infinite mercy is that it's not up to you whether you're saved or not maybe you're going to go to hell anyway maybe there's nothing you can do about it this is the whole thing of predestination um, but you can if you try as hard as you can to be available to God's grace and to believe in the teachings of the Bible, then maybe, maybe God will save you. And those who are saved show themselves in a very particular way. They, are, they, they do the work gladly. They show up to their, um, uh, their uh, like the, what replaced mass with, with, their, uh, with their regular worship. They, um, uh, they do not shirk their duties. And they do not cling to the pleasures of life because they are focused on um, the, the bountiful afterlife. Like so a lot of these themes keep coming back to, um, it, it, it's, it's this quality of, in some sense, you're predestined to go to heaven or hell. You can't do anything about it except reject God's love, in which case you can, you can choose to go to hell. That's your free will. Um, but if it so happens you're going to heaven, then you'll show up in a particular way. 
and this particular way gave birth to, among other things, the Protestant work ethic. So I'm going to see Tin asking, I'm sure you'll get to this, but I have a hard time wrapping my head around why a worldview based on so much shame would start spreading. Yeah, so I don't know exactly why. I don't know exactly why it started spreading, but I do know why it kept spreading once it started. Right? The mechanism is actually very straightforward. So um, I'm realizing as I'm trying to articulate it in my head, this, this may take a while to say, so it's straightforward, but it's not shaped for language. Um, it's sort of like, oh, uh, biological evolution is really straightforward. Now let me write a book to explain it. <laughs> so there's a quality sort of like that. Um, but this, this is uh, core to why our culture uh, behaves the way it does, why it orients the kind of way that it does, um, and, uh, and why mandatory child education is so important. Absolutely important. Um, so uh, one, one piece, this, it actually is very directly related to evolution. It's uh, mimetic evolution. Because what you're asking is why, like when you ask why would this worldview um, start spreading? Uh, this is the mimetic version of the genetic equivalent of why would a gene that creates pain in organisms start spreading? And it, it is literally the same question, just in a slightly different domain. The, the way that you answer it in biology is you say, well, what, in what way is it a better adaptation than competitor genes? That's the core question. Once you see the answer to that question, you see the mechanism. You see why it spreads. You see how it spreads. How does it, um, how does its existence allow it to be more effective at spreading than anything that would compete with it? Same thing in memes. Same thing in memetics. So what is it about this worldview, based so much on shame, that would cause it to spread? Well, part of it is that um, there is already a lot of anxiety and uncertainty in the world. Right? This is one of the big contributors of the Black Death. We went from everybody, like, it's, you don't even ask, everybody is part of Christendom. There are some, like, creatures. Um, <laughs> I see William answering Tim's question by saying, Moloch, just kidding. Yeah, yeah, kind of. It's a little bit like it. Um, uh, for those who don't know, Moloch being, in this context, a personification of a mechanism of how resources get distributed in a way that tends to suck for everyone. Okay. Um, so there's, there's all of this uncertainty and a kind of anxiety, sort of existential anxiety, that's sort of permeating. And it, in some sense, you could say that the Black Death traumatized the Western world. Okay. And a lot of what we're dealing with is the, the echoes of that trauma still living in us. Okay, so, um, so to some extent, what we're seeing is a civilizational version of what happens when um, somebody uh, beats their toddler and then the toddler grows up and has all of these really weird ideas about um, uh, not feeling loved unless they're hit and therefore hitting their kids because that's how they know to express love. And then their kids grow up with the same attitude. So you end up with this little, this, this piece of mimetic code that sort of goes across generations that beating is love. Like, why would that spread? Well, like it spreads because there isn't something that counters it effectively enough. So once you've devastated the meaning making foundation of the West, and now people are struggling to find an alternative meaning-making system at the same time that the church is trying to cling to its power and it's doing things like bringing in um, the, uh, the Inquisition in order to maintain its, its, uh, its evaporating power over the world. All of these forces come together to highlight there's actually nothing central, but there's no, there's no central focus of this is a way to cut through bullshit. We've lost almost all of our ways of cutting through bullshit. Science was the creation of a bullshit cutting mechanism, which is why science ended up taking over the world, but didn't notice all of the pieces of its own mimetic ancestry. 
So um, in particular, it's, uh, it's, it's vastly more uh, sorcerous and hermetic than, than most uh, scientists seem to know about at all. Closest they have is, oh, chemistry came from alchemy, but alchemy was stupid chemistry. Anyway, that's its own thing. Um, but there's, there's a way that you, you lose confusion by having a very, very clear vision of what to do. And part of that clarity is coming from like this smack and like, I'm awful. Right? Uh, now, this is going to be hard to transmit to non-traumatized adults, but by the time this thing gets going and you have people who are going around saying, oh yes, a wretch like me, I am awful, I am full of sin, I might be going to hell, I don't know what happens to me after death, I have a very rich fear of God, why would there be fear of God? God is love, God is agape, what, what, what's this about? Well, if fear and love are mixed together, they're part of the same trauma structure, then of course that's gonna be part of the experience. Uh, and often people are projecting uh, their relationship with their parents onto their concept of God. Just as an automatic, very, like th this is the whole business of needing to go down and uh, see what are the core pieces of your meaning making engine? Do you actually know what a cup is? seems very stupid, but it's actually quite important in order to sort of clean out the mimetic structures all the way down to the base and find out where have you received mimetic threads that are based on confusion that are sort of riding in your code. There's a, there's a whole process for pulling that out. But having not done that, if your parents sort of hate themselves and then they teach you that hatred, then hatred and love and support and, um, and condemnation of other and of self all gets intertwined. So you end up with these generations who are raised with this sense of, oh, I have to work hard in order to be okay in the eyes of my parents. And then later you scratch out parents and you say, God, but you don't notice that that's the shift you've made because that's not how the meme works. The meme is not about remembering how you got to this belief system. So once that engine appears and there isn't a larger mimetic structure that can compete with it in a meaningful way to be able, and I say meaningful in the sense like a, like a forcefully, effectively, right? Like, um, like Catholicism in theory could provide a competitor mimetic um, or a, a, com a competitor meaning-making engine something that gives as much context for why the world is the way it is, sense of legitimacy of the past and the future, and ways for you to participate. It, it could, in principle, do this, except that the legitimacy of its past got shattered with the Reformation. So the kind of move that you have to make in order to be a truly devout Catholic is very different from the kind of move that one had to do, um, certainly prior to the Reformation, um, and uh, um, it would have been even easier prior to the Black Death. So in practice, there just was nothing as effective at creating a sense of how to orient as this meaning-making system. So this got synthesized as this, this world is, is a, uh, almost like a testing ground. Like, is, is your soul going to make it? The arc of the past and the future is recognizing God's word came through Christ and into the Bible. And now your relationship with the Bible defines the future. And this is part of why um, uh, the whole business about the end of the world and revelations and the, the second coming of Christ and all that is such a huge emphasis in modern forms of Christianity, particularly in the United States, um, because they're, they're Protestant. <laughs> it's because... The, that is how to orient to the future. There is no, like, <laughs> without that, there's no sense of where is it going, right? The word of God offers an opportunity of salvation, which can have me go to heaven, and then I just sit there. Oh, uh, no, 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 God has a plan. What is that plan? Well, it's not coming through the church, because in the Protestant structure, the church has no 
lineage of legitimacy anymore. So now what? Uh, there must be a great cosmic plan. And I participate by absolving myself of sin. Okay. So um, I don't know if this really satisfies um, your question there, but like the, it, it's worth bearing in mind that ideas don't spread because they feel good. I, feeling good is one property that a worldview can have that can encourage it to spread. What defines whether a worldview spreads is whether it is better at spreading than competitor worldviews. That's it. That's, that's evolution. <clears throat> um, let's see, uh, William is asking something. It's, it's a longish question. Um, pardon the somewhat rhetorical question. Did Calvin invent the pathology? The, the making of pathology out of um, pleasure or just the innovation of self-flagellation without a whip. Maybe that's a, even the ancestor of sadomasochism, but instead of the clients going to the church, they go to dungeons. Uh, a fellow who helped my dad bring in the hay, grade one uh, dropout back in his day, once told me, quote, never kick yourself, end quote, and I'm still finding new nuance in what he said. Yeah, um, the short answer is I don't know. Um, I don't know whether, uh, it, it seems very close. Well, actually, Calvin definitely did not involve, invent the pathologization of pleasure. Uh, that, was, that was there long before. Um, hatred of the body, the attempt to get away from the flesh. Interestingly enough, you actually find the same mimetic thread seemingly to independently evolve in the East. I say independently because it has a different quality, but the, uh, the whole um, idea of monks as ascetics, that you go into a cave and you meditate because you are trying to see the truth and escape the, um, uh, escape the, uh, uh, the, the traps that the body provides to you. They didn't have such a clean mind-body split as the scar in the Western soul provides, but you see the same evolutionary thread possibly because it was a convergent evolutionary move in the wake of the agricultural revolution. I'm not quite sure about that one, but you see the same thing showing up. The, uh, it's not just a, um, a, a making pleasure pathological bad, etc. cetera. It is, um, it is actually about denial of the body and an attempt to view the flesh as wrong and corrupt. The same thread that uh, ultimately evolved particularly in the United States as um, uh, this obsession with and condemnation of sexuality. Um, the logic being something like sex is pleasurable, therefore it must be awful. <laughs> that's, that's not the whole thing. Sex is extremely complicated and every, um, every culture will end up evolving something complicated having to do with sex because sex has to do with the creation of children and children are essential for transgenerational survival of mimetic structures. So every culture ends up with very complicated ideas around sexuality. Um, but you also see this same kind of thing showing up in um, health food. Uh, our ideas of becoming pure, like the, the, you, you can have uh, clean food and um, junk food. And that uh, junk food is a temptation and that if you go into the temptation, you risk, like you, if you sin, then you risk going to the hell of being fat or ugly or sick, which means implicitly that being fat or unhealthy is, um, is an indication of having a sinful nature, that, you, that there is something wrong with you and that you are not sufficiently redemptive, that you aren't trying hard enough, that you aren't choosing the true path of salvation, that, uh, that uh, you are letting original sin corrupt you. This is the actual origin of fat shaming. Okay, so um, anyway, so that, that's wiggling specifically into the Calvinist influence there, but um, but yeah, so so all this uh, self-flagellation. Um, I think that I, I think Calvin, it wasn't so much that he invented self-flagellation without a whip, as that he uh, systematized it as a method of making meaning in a cultural way so that it was possible to 
uh, feel guilty about existing and have that be the basis by which, well, if you're feeling sufficiently guilty, guilt and the desire for redemption could be pulled together into a single thing where the reason you feel guilty is that you are recognizing the guilt of your original sin and your inherently corrupt, wretched ways of being, which is an essential thing for you to be aware of in order to truly mean the desire to have faith and to cultivate faith in salvation. So that whole system, Calvin, <clears throat> yeah, William mentions, uh, I th think it's actually better to eat good food, especially avoid empty calories. But yeah, we could take the moralizing out of it. Yeah, like the, there's an objective thing, which is if you eat food that is bad for your body, your body will have a hard time and that is unpleasant and it pr puts a weight on society. Those are facts. Okay, those are just like, that, that's true. This is sort of like saying if you put sugar in your gasoline tank, uh, your engine will do poorly. It will probably break down and stop working. Again, with this interesting, like not functioning and not able to do what it's supposed to do. Um, uh, but the, uh, the thing that I'm trying to highlight is specifically this moralizing element, this, this way in which it's as though there is, um, like, like the motivational source is not, oh, like you, you could imagine like a world free of the Calvinist threat or, or a psyche, a psyche, an individual free of the Calvinist threat might look at it with a very impartial, calm, maybe even self-kind attitude of, oh, I don't feel good when I eat this kind of potato chip. I don't like feeling bad that way. So right now I'm not going to eat any. Maybe in general, I'll, I'll avoid them. But maybe at some later point, it's like, oh yeah, I, I, right now I wanna eat some of these potato chips and I know that it feels bad for me in my body later. Um, and yeah, I think I want that. I think I want to enjoy this taste now and deal with the discomfort later. Clean, absolutely simple. <laughs> Just making choices based on facts about how your body interfaces with the world. But that isn't what we do for the most part. Right. Oh, I really should eat better. Okay, like that's, this is taking the moralizing engine in order to create internal pain, in order to uh, motivate yourself to get away from the pain so that, and using that as your fuel source so that you can go do things that you think are the right thing for you to do. The basic reason for this structure <laughs> the core reason for that particular structure is that and the, the evolutionary reason, I should say, the mimetic evolutionary reason for that particular looping structure is that um, if you are um, trapped in this like, I've got to get away from the pain, got to get away from the pain, and following whatever you think makes sense, then culture can program you by telling you what things make sense. You can be controlled with reasons. That doesn't mean they have to follow logic. It just means that they have to be something that your mind chooses to think. So that if you're escaping pain and you're doing what makes sense according to your worldview, then whatever programs your worldview decides what you do. And it can encourage you to keep doing it by making you feel worse. to keep you in this loop. This is one of the basic foundations of how we currently do culture. Did any wonder why we have such a problem with collective memory or the ability to be kind to each other? Why we can't pause and look around and go, wait, what we're doing doesn't make sense. Let's slow down and ask ourselves what we can do differently. So just want to highlight also, this is not unique to food. The same thing shows up for exercise. I really should exercise. I'm going to make myself go to the gym. Oh, look at me being lazy. I'm supposed to go for a run, but I don't want to. Uh, that's, a, uh, um, that's me not having enough willpower. I need to get more willpower. I need to motivate myself more. Why?
because it's following the idea of what you should do in order to have salvation. We don't talk this way anymore because in our postmodern era, we're actually at the, at the end of the postmodern era, the thing is, is, is eating itself and is starting to die. But in our postmodern era, um, something as simple as believing in a Christian worldview is uh, mostly untenable. That is, I don't mean that it's wrong, and I don't mean that it's, uh, we, we can prove that it's wrong. I'm not trying to do anything with the, with the naive atheist thing, because that's just another version of the same thing. I'm going to find salvation through um, purification of corruption of false beliefs. <laughs> Good luck with that. Um, but what I mean is that you can't just, uh, for instance, turn to the church and have meaning. I mean, you can, but you have to restrict yourself and you sort of have to uh, regress to a certain extent. Um, uh, what, what is needed is a different strategy for having meaning in the first place. How do you make sense of the world in a way that is in relationship to the arc of time that you can personally engage in, in practical ways? That is a challenge. I think there are answers to that question. There are very clear answers to that question. But they're, um, um, they're quite a bit different from the traditional ones at this point. So for now, uh, part, of, part of my vision for enacting this, fleshing this out is including just raising this, these little bits of awareness, noticing every time you're beating yourself up, like, oh man, I meant to take out the trash. I'm, I'm, why, why is that a problem? This, this, this is about never kick yourself and Williams bringing in. Like, yeah, why? What if you never kick yourself? Can you at least notice when you do? What happens in you such that kicking yourself feels like it's, uh, it's doing something good for you? If you could frame it as I am, uh, I am seeking salvation, can, can you see the Calvinist thread in it? And that doesn't mean that you are thinking of it in these religious terms about uh, damnation and salvation, um, but uh, it does mean something like uh, your mimetic ancestors probably were thinking that way. So if you can see how it fits, you may be able to see why you do it and how it doesn't make sense. It doesn't actually make sense. These are fragments of pain that have figured out how to propagate themselves in the absence of a meaning-making engine. It's worth looking around asking, do you have a it, it, on the level of, on the level of a, um, a, a Christian from a thousand years ago, do you have a sense of the world makes tremendous sense and that you are situated in the flow of history in a way where you know where your place is in the great scheme of things and you know how to engage and how to expand yourself into something more, do you feel utter clarity about this? Or like basically everybody in the postmodern era, do you feel more like you have fragments and bits and pieces of possibilities that are kind of confused about what progress means or even if progress is a coherent idea, what does it mean to work on yourself? Maybe there are bits of guilt or kicking yourself that are sort of living inside of you, but they're kind of isolated and they don't really make sense in the larger context of things. And you kind of know, oh, maybe, maybe it doesn't make sense for me to, um, to feel guilty about eating a potato chip, but I still do, and I don't know why. Or, well, I guess it kind of makes sense. I should be healthy, but I don't really know why it's important for me to be healthy other than it sucks to be sick. Like, does it feel scattered? Okay. This is highlighting the, the, the absence of a larger meaning-making framework, which, like, Zen might say, oh, great. That's a step towards sanity, <laughs> like not bothering with the framework at all. Okay. But um, if, you, if you have sort of uh, these fragments of broken frameworks and you're trying to live inside of all of them without even noticing that that's where they come from, it can be very, very painful. 
and it can be very exhausting to your body because you're busy motivating yourself with all of this pain. So um, I could ramble and take many more branches. Uh, this is half an hour longer than I originally wanted. So I want these episodes to be in the ballpark of an hour. And I will, uh, I'll see if I can strive for that arc. For now, I just invite you to notice, can you catch this thread? Can you notice this when it, when it shows up in you? What do you see when you look at it? And uh, in particular, I would warn you, um, don't believe your, your justifications too much when you're looking at this. One of the ways that this particular thread has uh, mutated in the last, I don't know, 50 years or so, 50 to 100 years, has been to really emphasize, actually been more than, it's, it's been more like 150 years or so. Anyway, however long it's been. Um, uh, is that in the absence of being able to refer to God and salvation, uh, to instead inject justifications. A lot of the, the whole American uh, upward social mobility and achievement is built on the backbone of Calvinism. So um, in business of, well, you want more money, don't you? And you wanna like be able to support your family or you wanna um, be able to travel and enjoy things, right? That's important. Right? So to be able to do that, you need to be able to like, be effective at your job and be able to have things that you're offering people. So like, how are you going to grow in order to let yourself do these things? But the reasons are coming second. Is there anything wrong with living a simple life? I'm not advocating it. I'm just highlighting. Um, what if you wanted to be homeless? Just live on the streets. What if that was actually more compatible with what you want? Would you be able to notice? So don't believe the reasons too much. Just, just don't, just don't believe them. <laughs> That's uh, the reasons are you know, most of the time when the mind is providing reasons for or justifications for actions that feel this sense of there's something wrong with me to motivate it. Most of the time, um, the, the reasons are not the real reasons. <clears throat> yeah. So uh, that doesn't mean that the reasons are factually wrong. It, what I mean is that it's not why you're trying to make yourself do it. learning to see the actual structure of your true motivations is a very uh, humbling and direct kind of perception. It's not about thinking about it at all. It's about looking at, oh, I just put on my running shoes. Why did I actually do that? Is that what I actually want to do right now? See, uh, Tim comes in saying, that story about why you should work or be productive really is a mythology. I think I can see that now. Great. Cool. Okay, so I'm going to close this here. I think an hour and a half is plenty. Um, thank you all for coming. And um, yeah, I will see you next week. <laughs>